and the trees fell and the trees fell one by one twenty in a day nothing could stand during the late 1800s to the early 1900s many towns in Michigan centered around big woods lumberjacks sawmills and lake shipping as time boy head bookkeeper and later owner of the Chicago Lumber Company my grandfather Will Crow was a first-hand observer when I landed at Manistique from the Goodrich Lines City of Ludington at exactly midnight, May 29, 1893, I was only 17 and had lived for two years on a cattle ranch on the treeless plains of eastern Colorado. I had never seen a lumbering camp, a sawmill, or even a big tree. There were screaming saws in five big mills, the hoarse whistles of lake steamers, and the flickering flames from open burners against the background of the immense forest. On the first Sunday, he walked three miles out to Indian Lake through groves of giant white pines so tall they blotted out the sun and there was no undergrowth. The first branches of the trees started 60 to 80 feet above the ground. He looked out across the lake, eight miles long and three miles wide, and saw it filled with white pine logs rafted up for the run down the river to the sawmills. There is no other tree which was so closely associated with people's daily lives and manner of living as the white pine. If you know the history of one lumbering town, as I did, you know the history of all the lumbering towns on the Great Lakes. I believe there were no more interesting segments of American life than the lumber industries, nor a more picturesque individual than the old-time lumberjack and river driver. Logging and river drive camps were identified by number and by name of the foreman. The Chicago and the Western Lumber Companies typically ran nine camps per season. One who worked in the lumber camps remembers, in the forest very few of the lumberjacks ever asked what the pay was. They were more concerned about the food, so they always asked, who's the cook? The wages for log cutters, skidding, log decking were $30 a month. The cooks received 50 and the Teamsters with their horses 45 and that included their board. Cookhouse rules were strict and strictly enforced. The men and women worked six long days a week and usually had Sundays off. These Swedish and German lumberjacks in a Delta County camp on the Ogons River used Sunday for music making. In lumber camps, every man wanted to work at the best camp, the camp that hauled the most logs. Every camp made its own World's Fair log load, a record load of white pine logs on a single sleigh. The World's Fair log load refers to a load of giant white pine logs made up near Ewan in Ontonagon County and exhibited at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. To show their skills, loggers unloaded and loaded it every day during the fair for the entertainment of visitors. Crow has a tale of a visit to one of these logging camps. Frank Cookson and I went up to Shingleton on the Haywire Railroad to inspect the large cedar contract. We walked on snowshoes seven miles, arriving at number one camp about dark. The deep snow clung in the most unbelievable shapes and everywhere the gigantic toadstools, enormous snow caps on the stumps. One on an 18 inch stem measured eight feet across. The beauty of the scene in the moonlight with the northern lights overhead surpassed all imagination. That night I dreamed I was a pygmy lost in a wilderness of giant toadstools. I was also semi aware of a rustling sound which later turned out to be a bunch of lively young teenager bedbugs out making a night of it under my pillow. The actual mechanics of cutting those big trees at the headwaters of the rivers and getting them down to the sawmills involves several operations. Timber cutting. Expert three-man crews cut the trees down, limbed them, and sawed them into logs of 16 feet where possible. The story is told that you could set a stake in the ground and the crew could fell a four or five foot tree so that it would hit the stake and drive it into the ground. Winter skidding and hauling. Men and horses would skid or haul the logs out of the woods to the logging roads created overnight by large ice sleds. 
Immense loads of logs would be piled on sleighs and hauled by horse or oxen teams to be driven down rivers in the spring. Oxen were first used for hauling loaded sleds out of the woods and on the iced logging roads. The problem of shoeing oxen was the main reason they were later retired. The blacksmith could not pick up an ox's foot to put a shoe on as he could with a horse. If an ox's foot is lifted off the ground, the ox will either lie down or fall down. Horse teams gradually replaced the oxen and later mechanical means of various types were developed to bring out the logs. Spring river driving was tough. Long hours, sometimes in waist deep water, wrestling big logs off sandbanks, wading swamps or walking narrow pole trails up in the air, cold meals maybe, and perhaps sleeping wherever night caught up with them, fighting noceums and mosquitoes. The river hogs, as they were named, had to see that the logs were kept continually on the move. When the logs jammed and piled up in a huge mass, they would go out on the jam with their peavies to release the key log. When this log was freed, the water and the logs roared down the stream and it was a wild scramble to safety for the river drivers. Where the rivers met still water, such as a wide lake, before continuing down to the river mouth, the logs were rafted into large booms and a paddle wheeler, such as this beached mud hen, towed them across the lake and into the next stretch of river. The river drives were usually followed in a wanagon, or crudely constructed cook shack on a large raft with a stovepipe sticking out of the roof. This was the home of the crew during the drive. Here they ate and slept, unless they slept in tents along the way, which they often did. The largest tree ever cut by the CL Company was on the Driggs River above Sini in 1898. They had trouble driving this log because it was too big to float clear. When the men got one end out in the stream, the current simply rolled it over to the other side to hang up again. Cookson sent Harvey Saunders for a large auger and some dynamite and blew it into three pieces. Harvey rode these pieces down the river to catch up with the drive. The principle of driving three million feet of big logs down a small stream relied on earthen and log dams built way back in the forest by man and horse teams. When the river drivers were ready, water from the dams upstream would be released five or six hours before the logs were put into the river. It had to be done at just the right time and there had to be flood water behind the logs to keep them afloat. A little girl came up to me the other night and asked if I could tell her what a crib was. It flashed through my mind that she was just ribbing me, but I told her that cribs in the river were big square fares made of 16 or maybe 20 foot logs bolted together at the corners and filled with heavy rocks. The cribs were anchored to the river bottom and extended about six feet above the water. Their purpose was to back up the booms. I told her that a boom was a string of logs or tree trunks chained together end to end, which floated on the water to control the logs coming down the river so that the drivers could read the log marks and send the logs into their proper channel for each mill. It was a lively scene with river crews guiding the constant stream of floating logs using their long wooden pike poles with sharp point and hook ends to push or pull the logs. These river men were expert log riders. One thing common to cowboys where Crow had been working when he was 14 and lumberjacks was the similarity of the cattle brands and log marks. Many different log marks, some quite fanciful, were used throughout Michigan. The big sawmills of the White Pine era in Michigan were almost all located on deep water on the Great Lakes, usually at the mouth of a stream. In the 1880s and 1890s, from 120 to 126 million feet, all pine were floated to sawmills on just one river, the Manistique, every year. Waterways were indispensable to the early lumbering in Michigan. Mills were located at the mouth of the Menominee, which had 43 mills at one time, Ford, Escanaba, Rapid, Whitefish, Sturgeon, Manistique, Tequamanon, Sucker at Grand Marais, the Dead, Yellow Dog, and Ontonagon Rivers. Pequaming in Barraga County was the first large-scale lumbering and milling operation in the Lake Superior region. 
Logs along Lake Superior, which were not milled locally, were gathered into huge booms and rafted to Pequaming and Hancock from as far away as Grand Marais, a float of 150 miles along the south shore of Lake Superior. Sawmills of the time used either double band steam saws or gang saws. A band saw is a thin steel belt with teeth on one edge. It runs over two large wheels at a speed of about two miles per minute. Two men ride the carriage and have to be good on their feet to stay on. The band saw cuts only one log at a time, but very fast. A gang saw is a rack of large thick saws set in a vertical frame that oscillates up and down, cutting only on the downstroke, the saws being spaced at varying distances to cut lumber of the thickness desired. The gang saw cuts the entire log or cant in one operation, but turns a lot of timber into sawdust. I was working on the company books one day when I was asked to figure out how much money could have been saved in last year's cut by using band saws instead of the gang saws. As I remember it, the figure was around $93,000. In other words, the thick gang saws were cutting about $93,000 worth more of one inch by 12 inch clear white pine boards into sawdust than the band saws would have done. The white pine lumber was piled on waterfront docks and then on to sailing ships for transport to many lake ports. From the summer of 1863, when the first lumber schooner dropped anchor off the mouth of the river, the waterfront was a scene of great activity in all the lumbering towns on the Great Lakes. For about 30 years, all freight and passenger traffic in and out was by water. Boats were constantly coming and going from Green Bay, Chicago, to Wanda, New York, and all ports in between. I once counted 29 lake boats along 18 lumber schooners tied up in the harbor in the slips. All this was new and very fascinating to me, and I spent as much spare time as possible rowing a boat or sculling a yawl around the harbor. One evening I saw three schooners put out under full sail in a race for the Chicago market, and the setting sun on their sails was a beautiful sight. The Heartline boats were in nearly every day, and independent lumber schooners were continually coming and going. The waterfronts were busy in all lake ports. The Hart boats also ran excursions to Mackinac Island and Petoskey now and then. Lumber schooners like the Quick Step of Michigan City, Indiana, observed sailing out of Ontonagon Harbor in 1912, were called lumber hookers and were designed for shallow water operations, assisted to dock by a steam tug they carried rocks or iron when empty to provide ballast. It was a picturesque sight in the spring when the Indians sailed a fleet of their Mackinac boats over from the Beaver Islands. These two-masted open boats were very fast and seaworthy, and the Indians were excellent sailors. Fishing was a large part of the early days. Tons of whitefish were shipped to Chicago and other ports along Lake Michigan. What was town life like in those years? The Chicago Lumber Company, like all others in Michigan lumbering towns, was more than just a lumber company. It was the commissary for a community, including the county, of nearly 7,000 people shut off from the rest of the world all winter. Every fall, the company shipped vast quantities of goods and supplies into the harbor from Green Bay and Chicago, Upper New York State, and Detroit every conceivable article of use. There was a company doctor to bring you into the world and a company hearse to take you out of it and up on the hill. Two youngsters stopped me and said, Mr. Crow, we like to read about the lumberjacks, but whatever did the rest of the people do, especially the young folks? It must have been terribly dull and lonesome in those old deal horse and buggy days. You must have been bored to death. There was plenty of parties, picnics, socials, study classes, debates, parlor games, buggy rides, and sleigh rides. The families gathered in the evenings for games and schoolwork. And the modern automobile is a thousand years behind old Dobbin when you're taking a girl out for a ride. You were perfectly safe driving with one hand, or you could even loop the reins over the dashboard and have both hands free. Cows enjoyed complete freedom of the city wandering the streets and looking into the post office. 
Many families owned cows, and every yard was enclosed with a board fence to keep them out. Harper's Weekly published a humorous article about the cows in Manistique, and soon thereafter the city council passed a cow ordinance. A special train to the Big Spring was chartered for the annual Sunday school picnic. It was an all-day affair and one of the high spots of the year. There were all kinds of contests, games, and sports for everyone. There was a raft of railroad ties and boards on the spring, big enough to take four or five people out at a time. The 4th of July was ushered in by cannon salutes at sunrise. In the afternoon, there were baseball games, field sports, airplane rides, and bicycle or horse races at the fairgrounds. Topped off at night by as large and spectacular a display of fireworks as the community could afford. There were indoor baseball games throughout the Upper Peninsula, including at the Star Opera House. Will Crow, seen second from the left in the bottom row of this team photo, was the pitcher for the all-star team, which it is reported won over the crack professional Spalding team from Chicago three years in a row. Once in an indoor ball game in the Star Opera House, a visiting player batted what would have been a sizzling home run straight down the center of the diamond, but it struck one of those overhead trusses, bounced back, and was caught by our catcher, Jack Williams, the only time I ever heard of a batter being robbed of a home run by the opposing team's catcher. The only means of travel for long distances was by railroad train or boat and horse and buggy for trips in the country or to neighboring towns, but the bulk of travel was on foot then along came the bicycle. Will Crow was an active participant in bicycle races throughout the area. In a 1937 article and in his book, Lumberjack, he remembered the bicycle times. This is the age of the bicycle craze. Everybody has wheels in the head, if not on the ground, and what to wear when wheeling is a leading topic of conversation among the ladies. It was improper for a girl to show her limb above the ankle, and there were many different styles of bloomers and divided skirts designed to solve the problem. The pine has now been gone for many years, and the fleets of steam barges and picturesque schooners with their tall masts in every harbor and white sails dotting the blue waters of the Great Lakes are only a memory. My ideal old-time lumberjack was Lyman Timmerman, who had worked for Weston in New York and on the Allegheny River drives. He left for California in 1904. I visited him there, and while the Santa Clara Valley seemed like paradise to me, he said, yes, Bill, it's nice, but I miss the woods. I miss the wind in the pine tops, the cry of timber, the creaking of the log sleighs, the sprinkler and the ice roads, and the big horses straining to start the load. I miss the dinner horn echoing through the timber, and the evenings in the bunkhouse around the camp stove. I even miss the straw bunks, and I'd give all this to bring those days back. That was a man's country. The saga of the old-time lumberjack in the woods and the whitewater man on the rivers lasted almost 100 years. Beginning with the coast of Maine, it moved across the country to the western coast. In your travels, look for the giant white pine stumps left from the lumbering and the wildfires, which are now being overtaken by new growth in the woods and fields. Then look along the lakes and waterways for white pine trees with uplifted branches, links to our colorful past of life in lumbering towns and the years when the woods and rivers echoed to the shouts of the lumberjacks and the sounds of the saws. For when the trees fell, trees fell, for one by one, Fifteen a day, nothing could stand in my box saws away, and the trees fell. Their souls went to heaven, but my soul still to move it tell. Maybe hell, maybe hell, but it's much too early to tell.
new 70th anniversary edition of Lumberjack, Inside an Era in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, by William S. Crow, editors Lynn McLaughlin Emmerich and Anne McLaughlin Weller. Ask your bookseller or purchase on Amazon.com. Choose your edition, hardcover, paperback, ebook, audio, iTunes or Audible. Learn more at lumberjackbook.com. A unique first-hand story of a lumberjack.